All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, we have a very special guest on. His name is Kirk Schneider. Uh, Kirk Schneider is a licensed psychologist and leading spokesperson for contemporary existential humanistic and existential integrative psychology. Uh, He's been working on bringing this to the United States for decades at this point and uh, has ran to be the president of the American Psychological Association three times now, uh, which is quite a a distance that uh, existentialism has gone since the 60s. Um, So welcome to the show, Kirk, and how are you doing today? Well, thanks so much, Jared. I'm I'm doing well, and I'm I'm loving your background. I just noticed the Starry Night, uh, which is one of my f- absolute all-time favorite paintings. Yeah, I, uh, I saw that you on your website. You had uh, some kind of impressionistic artwork in the background. So, ah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, I could pull that up if you want to talk about anything on your site, but. Uh, just to begin with, uh, let everyone know how I came across your work, which is probably obvious uh, in my studying of existentialism. Uh, when I was probably a teenager, I found Rollo May's book, Existence, at the used bookstore and read it, and then was very inspired by that. It probably changed the course of uh what I was interested in when it comes to philosophy and psychology from then. And then um, some years down the road, I came across your book that you did with Rollo May, Mm -hmm. where you really uh, expand on what was offered in that, really that first book on existential psychology that was in English in the United States and Mm -hmm. uh, give insight into how that could be applied. And so I got a copy of that right here. I think it was. Looking for the publishing date. Oh, 1995. Yeah. 1995. So that's 40 years, well, 30 years since uh, 30. that first book was out. But this is, I just want to say this is a really fascinating book. It opens up with uh a forward from Philip Zimbardo, who mm. everyone knows about because he did the Stanford Prison Experiment. Yes. And it has uh, some work from Abraham Maslow in there. Mm. Uh, it goes through uh, both the literature background and the philosophical and the psychological background for existentialism. And then uh, has all sorts of practical applications and case studies. Yeah. So... Um, just to get that out of the way, how did you, how did you wind up working with Rollo May? Well, I was blessed, uh, as a, a first term graduate student at the Humanistic Psychology Institute in San Francisco back in 1980, uh, the marketing director of the school, a woman named Linda Conti invited me to meet with Rollo at his home to write an article about him and his work for the school newsletter. And I had, you know, very much venerated Rollo's work for many years uh, as an undergrad uh, and maybe even high school uh, introduced to his work early on. And I was very excited, you know, to meet him. In any case, I, I had that intimate hour or so with him uh, interviewing him for the article, which I ended up writing. And then soon after that, uh, I was in a a mentorship class with James Bugenthal, who is one of Rollo's major disciples, almost a contemporary, another founder of existential humanistic psychology. And uh, there were like 10 of us, and Rollo invited us to his home for a seminar. And that's where I got to meet and and know Rollo uh, that much more. And actually, we had 
I, I, I believe we, we really had a, a philosophical kinship because I was very interested in uh, how people deal with the contrasts and contradictions of our lives. The paradoxes, you know, can we come, the whole question of whether it is kind of healthier or more vital to live with paradox, to live with the contrasts and contradictions, be able to explore them and apply them creatively uh, and in terms of bridge building among each other. And of course, Rollo May had written extensively about paradoxes of life as had existentialists before him and his mentor, Paul Tillich, especially. Uh, but uh, Kierkegaard and, and Nietzsche, for sure. Uh, and so we, we had that kind of natural kinship. And that began uh, correspondence, uh, more, um, more discussions between us, uh, a closer relationship, uh, a profound uh, mentoring relationship. And he, he ended up on my dissertation committee. And we also uh, collaborated uh, to a notable extent on our concern with uh, where we saw transpersonal psychology heading at the time. We were concerned that it was becoming overly presumptuous about the human human potentiality. And this and was- when you- when you say that, do you mean like the positive psychology movement? Not so much positive psychology movement, more uh, the movement to promote uh, a, a kind of transcendental psychology, you know, spiritual. Uh, Ken Wilber's work was a, a spearhead of that. He wrote books like No Boundary, Up, hmm. from, e Up from Eden. Uh, Is Eckhart Tolle... Part of that uh, power of now, Eckerd totally. Um, uh, probably, yeah, to some degree, an outgrowth. I mean, there are all kinds of branches of, of transpersonal psychology, but this was one particular strain that seemed to be almost um, overtaking humanistic psychology, existential humanistic psychology at the time, uh, especially through Wilbur's work. And mm. it was concerning to us because it seemed that he was making claims that were extremely presumptuous about how uh, people, if they became master meditators, could achieve a godlike consciousness. And of course, this this challenges, you know, these very time-honored phenomenological notions, very intimate experiential notions of how humans struggle with paradox and contradictions in our lives and how so many of us experience life that way. We experience right. life uh, uh, from our vulnerability and our limitations. And to claim that certain people have achieved a godlike consciousness, including himself, uh, we thought was pretty perilous uh, terrain, uh, not only in, in terms of the advocacy at the individual level uh, through certain, let's say, meditative techniques, but but at the political uh, level, you know, the, the danger of uh, uh, some kind of uh, grandiose or even tyrannical leadership that, that right. could come out of that, that mentality. And, and we also saw all these gurus at the time with very clay feet. <laughs> you know, I, I, and Dafri John, one of his disciples, uh, you know, found to be running a sex ring and and abusing uh, the members with with alcohol, alcoholic. Uh, uh, I guess alcoholic frenzies of some kind. So there, there were real problems being seen among the a number of the, the leaders in that movement. And that's interesting because I feel like this happens periodically with psychology. I even think it's been happening recently with the mindfulness trend and 
uh, yes. things like that. I, I think any time that psychology or any philosophy really uh, be, becomes dogmatic and absolute absolutist, um, you're, you're running into a lot of uh, peril, philosophically, therapeutically, politically. And uh, so when when something like even mindfulness becomes more of a ploy or, or just a technique and is not seen as part of a whole lifestyle and uh, in, integrated into you know, the, the natural vulnerabilities and limitations of being human. I think, I think one runs into, into problems. And that's really what we were trying to bring up with, with our focus on, on the paradoxes of life. I ended up writing a book called The Paradoxical Self. That was my first book. And Rollo beautifully wrote the preface to that book. Um, so that, that was, as I say, very much part of our kinship. But uh, yes, it continues today. I, I want to be clear that I am not anti-transpersonal psychology. I'm, I'm anti-presumptuous uh, psychology um, and absolutist psychology. And, and that's really where, where Rollo is coming from as well. Uh, he was concerned about dogma okay. uh, infusing into the field. I, I, in fact, I, I've... I think I've come quite a ways in terms of embracing a spiritual, psycho-spiritual path uh, with my own investigations of the sense of awe, A-W-E, toward living, which I define as the sense of humility and wonder or sense of adventure toward living, which I think can be a beautiful, uh, vitalizing path for many people. Which is very much not uh, the sort of emotion that's associated with a lot of existential writers like Heidegger, Sartre, writing about angst and anguish and dread. And, and it, it's not it's not opposite them. It's but it's it's different on the spectrum. So I, I see the sense of awe as a powerful paradoxical uh, understanding of the spiritual. In other words, it, it very much highlights our unease and our apprehension toward being and existence. But at the same time, and with equal fervor, it, it embraces uh, or acknowledges our capacity to transcend and to venture out and, and to... Uh, and to be in wonder about life. So, uh, so it 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 does uh, overlap with with Sartre and and certainly Heidegger, etc. When you describe it that way, the word that comes to mind for me is the sublime, which yeah, yeah. you hear used a lot, like by the surrealists and and Edmund Burke, I, I believe, was the originator of that. Uh, Okay. I think in the late 1700s. But, but yeah, but yeah, it, it, it is similar because, and it and actually relates to what I would call classic horror books and films. I, I wrote a book called Horror and the Holy. Wisdom really? The Monster Tale. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll um, have to look for that. That's Well, I, I explored those tales from an existential perspective. And it was very much about how those classic tales, which employ what H.P. Lovecraft calls cosmic fear. Right. And our relationship to existence <laughs> and all that that can bring up. Um, that those classic tales point the way toward a possible uh, experience of the awesomeness of existence versus just the horror. Uh, they, although they emphasize the horror, and they're often cautionary tales because they they address beings and and people who overreach, <laughs> you know, like a Frankenstein, right? Uh, attempting to duplicate life, but but nevertheless, within that, 
you have a Van Helsing, right, who, who's willing to explore these paranormal realms and who's an adventurer, but yet is very grounded by the science of his times and skepticism. And so you I'm forgetting I'm That's forgetting cool. the guy's name right now who has been exploring horror uh, philosophically probably 10 uh, years ago at this point, but there, there been a, a uh, Carol. Was it Carol? No. Um, you know, but Bataille, Bataille, the French uh, philosopher. Much yeah. more recent yeah. than that. But, yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, Susan Sontag also explored wrote those a yeah. book with Alexander Galloway. Let me just see if I could look it up real quick. Okay. Uh, Eugene Thacker. I don't know. Oh, interesting. T-H-A. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he's got a series of three books specifically uh, looking at the same same kind of stuff. Interesting. But wow. yeah, um, so that <laughs> that's a really interesting avenue. I know. Mm -hmm. uh, so since you've also taken your uh, approach to more social issues um yeah i know for example during trump's presidency i don't know if you're still doing this but mm -hmm. you were putting together a dialogue between yeah. opposing political sides yes. trump supporter and i guess liberal or mm -hmm. uh and that's very much it's still interpersonal but you're getting into the uh into the social a bit more and it do you want to talk about that a little bit and well yeah no, i appreciate you bringing that up i mean that is part of my growing edge to this day and i'm still uh, facilitating these these dialogue groups i call it the experiential democracy dialogue which i drew to some degree from the grassroots uh, conflict mediation group called braver angels which okay. is a 10,000 plus member group throughout the US that brings uh, conservatives and liberals together for living room style dialogues. I'm a trained moderator for the group, although I haven't worked with them for a little a period of time. But I've been focusing more on this intimate one on one dialogue. They do some of that, but it's more group oriented, I would say. Um, but I've been uh, really attempting to translate existential principles of cultivating presence as a way of uh, bridging the the gap of, of differences of otherness really right and so we were talking about that before you know this whole focus again on the contrasts and contradictions that we all come up against as we live and as we encounter difference in our lives. And so this is one way of, uh, through an existentially humanistic lens, uh, helping to humanize dialogues between people on very contrasting sides of, a, of political or cultural issues. And, yeah. you know, uh, I'm curious how about the results, how it's, uh, how some of that has turned out. Well, at an anecdotal level, uh, I would say generally quite well. Uh, I've gotten very good feedback overall about the process. I've done a number of groups uh, more in the acad academic realm, uh, conferences and that sort of thing, and with students. But um, I did participate in a dialogue uh, with a, a psychoanalyst and a right-wing radio host, <laughs> oh. uh, which was interesting. And that seemed to go well too. And, and she had a particularly good rapport with this guy, even though she was coming from a completely different side, very much, you know, liberal and democratic or Democrat, I should say. But 
Uh, but also the uh, experiential democracy dialogue, I'm glad to say, I think, <laughs> is being uh, formally researched by a dissertation student from the University of Manchester. And so we just did a, a demonstration uh, for her, her, her thesis uh, with, with a group of British, uh, I think, mainly counselors in training to, you know, to work with the, this dialogue format. And, and so we'll see what the results will be. Well, I know that some of this is on YouTube. Uh, yes. So I'll, I'll find some of that and put it in the description so people can watch it. But Thank you. it's very interesting. I, there's also some stuff I came across once where you were, they were almost like a uh, theatrical performances <laughs> of case studies or something along those lines that you, you were giving a presentation and um, the subject it, you was being walked through their, their psychological trauma. And I don't know, I'll have to, I'll have to find that again. Yeah, well, if, if you can give me the example, I'm not sure what that is. Oh, case studies. You I mean uh, a tape I did on a recording I did on existential integrative. So I think it was, yeah, and okay. it was it was like a demonstration of what it actually looks like. Um, well, I, I that was more of a talk, but I but I did uh, do a series of uh, videos with an actual uh, a person uh, for the APA for the American Psychological Association. It's called Existential Humanistic Therapy Over Time. Where I work with this person for six sessions. Uh, I think that was it. That's what I'm thinking of. I okay. guess I assumed that it was uh, uh, being performed. <laughs> oh no, 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 not at all. That was that was a real client. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, one of the, I mean, one of the things that I'm most fascinated about uh, in your in a lot of the work you do is that you are able to take such a sometimes abstract philosophy and bring it into real practice uh, mm -hmm. in some of the ways we just mentioned. Well, that, that has been a lifetime devotion for me. I mean, I, like many other people, have been concerned about certain trends within existential psychology and philosophy that can become too remote and, and abstract, you know, remote from day-to-day -day life that we lead and it's partly the writing is can be obscure and really difficult so i've tried to bring it more down to earth i, I think my predecessor rollo may and uh, well some others not too many but have have really mastered that beautifully um but so that, yeah, that, that is a strong belief of mine that we, we need to bring these principles down to earth, you know, to what's happening on the ground and how, how can they help us here and now? Yeah. In general, I think philosophy, ten, it tends to be difficult to do that. And a lot of the time, like if you're talking about post-structuralism or mm -hmm. something like that, you wind up with more like a sociology, which in practice means you sort of need to be a large institution to to apply it because you're dealing with people in mass and not people as individuals um it's another tension yeah so that's yeah i think that's an existentialism is really conducive to that um out of the all the philosophies i mean stoicism gets a lot of uh mm. application especially lately, but. Well, yeah, I think existentialism, at least the, the, the kind that I embrace uh, through uh, people like uh, Merleau Ponty, uh, Rollo May, uh, I think R.D. Lang also, uh, it, it, uh, really emphasizes one's whole body experience of living, not just right. the head, not just the behavior, the external behavior or conditioning. Uh, you know, not just affect either necessarily, although it's an important piece. But, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> the yes. Mind, body, spirit, um, you know, imagination, intuition, uh, 
guts, <laughs> you know, the visceral. I mean, the the whole thing as much as one can get at that. And, that, and to me, that's phenomenology, really a test right. yet at the intimate experience of living, breathing people. Exactly. And this is uh, my big disappointment when I was learning um, just psychology 101 was how much it wasn't uh, like that. I and don't know what you mean. statistical and, uh, you know, like these um, experiments that are mostly built to demonstrate kind of a determinism, uh, you know. Yeah, often yeah. finding something of what they're looking for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and also you restrict the pool of of inquiry, of, of questions that you can ask people. Or and or you restrict how they can answer, right? They can only answer measurable uh responses or responses mm -hmm. on a, a scale. And, and that's very different from a much more, you know, free associating, freewheeling exploration of of the thoughts, feelings, sensations that come up around it's, a particular problem. Yeah, it's also a really, uh, I think, so Noam Chomsky wrote uh, about B.F. Skinner a long time ago yeah. and was... Uh, you know, pointing out how behaviorist assumptions like Skinner's really excused forms of tyranny in society and things like that. And I don't think Chomsky pointed to existentialism as an alternative, but that mm -hmm. tension between the behaviorists or now would be like a neuroscience, cognitive behaviorism, I guess. Yeah. No, I um. I think that it's a really like low level uh, um, thing that's happening in our society where people are all, you know, as Sartre would say, it leads to a form of bad faith to turning people into things. Yes. Yeah, into rocks. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this goes to the whole problem of reductionism, I believe. Uh, reductionism, uh, or what I call the polarized mind, which is the fixation on single points of view to the utter exclusion of competing points of view. Um, I, I think in so many ways, our society has moved toward that reductionism and toward thingification, if you will, partly because we become more and more enamored with devices and machines, the machine model for living. Yes. Because it's it's seductive. It gives us quick quick fixes, quick answers. Um, it gives us the illusion of power and control. Uh, and sometimes and I'm not denying the reality. I mean, these things can really be helpful and effective. At a sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... And, and efficient. But the issue is, do they become the be all and end all? And that's what a number of us are really protesting, is that there's much more to living, at least for many people, than to live like an efficient machine. Yeah. Uh, or to have some kind of, you know, cleanly synchronized tranquil state that one lives through continually which yeah is such a um such a huge goal for so many people especially the more mm -hmm. corporate <laughs> uh one's job is from well, speaking from experience <laughs> but um yeah i, I and I, I think this is where the socioeconomic model for living is is so important in terms of driving so much of these trends. Again, the instant, the, the emphasis on speed, instant results and appearance and packaging. I mean, there you have a great part of the core of the, at least the amoral version of capitalism. 
Sure. Um, um, yeah, exactly. And there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff that could be unpacked there. Uh, yeah. And I think we both agree that existential integrative or existential humanistic, I'm not entirely sure what the differences there are, but uh, is a, um, a solution to that kind of single-minded focus. Well, it's an alternative to it. Yeah, I, I'd be hesitant to say solution with a capital S, but it, it certainly, I believe, presents a fruitful alternative vision. Yeah, on a number so, of levels, individual and collective. Absolutely. Which, yeah, it, it would take a long time to, I think, explain all the different ways that that's true. Yes. But yes. Uh, both of us, I think, are dedicated to, in the long term, fleshing that out. Yes, I, I'm, I'm with you there. So I hear that you have a new book coming out. Um, I do. Uh, tell us a little about that. Well, I'm very excited about the book uh, because in many ways, it's the culmination of a lot of the work I've been doing around paradoxical self, paradoxical living. Um, and also, <coughs> excuse me, addressing the, the issue of the polarized mind. Uh, I, the, the book is called Life Enhancing, Life Enhancing Anxiety, Key to a Sane World. And I know that sounds counterintuitive because it seems like anxiety is just skyrocketing right now. And it is uh, anxiety, depression you know, addiction, despair, right, violence, etc. We've we've got so much of it. Uh, but I actually conspicuously highlight that term because I believe that well, I hope that that will jar us into realizing that one of the reasons we have so much anxiety in our culture is precisely because we don't face the deeper anxieties that would preempt and and limit or even prevent a lot of the life-destroying anxiety that we now experience. What I mean by that is that so much of our lives are fear-driven and they have to do with fears of the unknown. That's basically how I define anxiety, fear of the unknown. And it, that happens almost right from birth for many people. When caretakers and the culture are filled with anxiety about otherness and differences within oneself as well as toward the world. Uh, right. And that gets imposed on the child who already is experiencing a sense of groundlessness and helplessness by being thrown into the world. Uh, that's the beginning of a movement toward anxiety-driven living. Uh, could, it could be a move toward a very uh, uh, rule-driven rule and regimented lifestyle. It could mean... Uh, a move toward uh, strong prejudices, toward other races, religions, cultures, etc., um, and and certainly could lead to an estrangement from oneself, one's own new emerging thoughts, feelings, sensations, etc. So when 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 a child is not met right from the beginning uh, in that floundering, in that struggle with difference and otherness, we, we can get set off on, on a, a problematic track right away. And I, and I think our culture and many cultures actually, that, that attempt to avoid addressing that deeper meeting um, have, this, have this problem. And as a result, uh, there's all kinds of fallout from that, uh, which 
in the worst forms leads to a great deal of individual destructiveness, psychological destructiveness, and physical destructiveness, because one is not one has not come to terms with otherness and difference within oneself and toward others. So uh, my my book is uh, focusing on on that piece, the developmental piece of life enhancing anxiety. And then it goes into applications of life enhancing anxiety uh, in terms of the social and political realm, in, in terms of uh, individual development, including my own. I have a whole section on my own struggle with life enhancing anxiety um, and, and also spiritual realms. Uh, it's very wide ranging. Uh, literary <laughs> realms as well in art. But uh, so I should probably define what I mean by life enhancing anxiety. Yes. <laughs> to the capacity to live with and make the best of the depth and mystery of existence. So the capacity to live with and make the best of the depth and mystery of existence defined maybe uh, a little less formally, capacity to live with and make the best of the contrasts and contradictions of existence. Meaning that it's viewing anxiety as much more multidimensional than we usually do in our culture and other cultures that, that almost conspire to eradicate anxiety, these deeper anxieties. Um, that anxiety is not just uh, apprehension and dread and paralysis, but it also uh, it can include elements of wonder and discovery. And, and actually, that's what I think happens at birth. I don't think it's just a trauma of birth, as Otto Rank put it eloquently. Okay. I think he really captured a lot of this. He, he has a whole psychology of difference that begins at birth um, and leads to all these divisions within self and between self and society. But I think it's a drama of birth because it includes elements of wonder and discovery at birth as well as terror and, and disarray. That's that's my sense <laughs> of what so, I experienced and actually presiding at my child's experience. I was just on uh, someone else's show and we were talking about um, Wilhelm Reich and sort of uh, the impact he had on the sexual revolution and some of these ideas about character armor and um, the way basically this idea, this developmental idea in psychology that sounds somewhat similar to what you're saying that yeah. anxieties about um about just about everything lead to a closing off of the of the um someone's being from experience yeah yeah he, he talks about body armor yes it's very very similar and it it brings in again the whole challenge of cultivating presence greater presence to one's whole bodily experience. And that's just not something that we emphasize very much in this culture. We have a few places for it, and they're very difficult to access, actually, like depth psychotherapy, especially experiential depth psychotherapy, where the client and therapists are real people, you know, sort of like fellow travelers, as right. Earth Nolan put it. Uh, as distinct from doctor and patient in very, you know, hard categorical uh, fashion. Medical, yeah. Med medicalized model, right, right. So where, where do we have that in our culture? Well, we've got some, you know, some wonderfully seasoned people who embody that um, through, through their life path, some of it through their own creativity and artistry. And, and some through their psychological struggle. Um, and, and we have some, we have places uh, where people can get that kind of longer term intensive psychotherapy like I was afforded. 
but other than that, I mean, you know, it's 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 just uh, it's it's a rat race basically. I mean, we're just. You know, so you might find people. this really interesting. I don't know if you've heard about it before, but there's something called soma therapy, which comes out of Brazil. And it's a somatic kind of therapy that's done as a group. There's actually a documentary about it. Um, and it also, it comes out of radical politics. Uh -huh. uh, this, this guy, Roberto Freire, Huh. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, I don't know if you could see on the screen, I'm sharing the, yeah, um, it's heard some about him, but I don't, I don't know a lot. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I, that I'm really interested in is the way that, uh, everyday people can take principles like you're talking about mm -hmm. and apply them in their in their own settings you know part yeah. of part of what you just said about how difficult it is to access uh something like psychotherapy or psychoanalysis really and uh, depth and experience yeah. And analysis yeah and so i'm excited that you're doing this work because you know um it takes some some effort by someone like me to to read and to uh, get into it, but it's a lot more accessible than um, uh, years of going to a psychoanalyst or uh, yeah. something like that. Um, yeah, and again, it depends on the the person of the analyst. Yes, but but but, but right. I mean, just uh, financially, uh, especially these days so hard to access and and it's it's yeah it, it is intensive it takes a lot out of your life so I, I do try to give suggestions about how people can uh, at least work on cultivating this life enhancing anxiety a greater presence to challenges that come up uh, and have suggestions in the book about that uh, and when is that coming you, out? Well, it's actually coming out in a few days. It's uh, February 1st. So, uh, okay. It, it is available right now on online, you know, Amazon, et cetera. Uh, University Professors Press. So, actually, an existential humanistic uh, publishing company that I'm very appreciative of. <laughs> uh, did not know about them. That will keep me busy. Oh yeah, yeah. I've I've done several books with them. Here it is. Okay, I see the Kindle. All right, I'll definitely link to that too. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to get this out before then. Um, actually, I'm not even going to be doing a lot of interviews this this year. So, mm. yeah, this one with you is going to be uh, one of the main things I do. Oh, I'm very honored. Uh, um, so we talked a little about your book. We talked a little bit about your background and some of your work in more political and social fields. Is there anything else you wanted to uh, tell the audience about? Well, to devote devote as much time as one can to pausing in life. Uh, again, my, my mentor, friend Rollo May, uh, wrote a beautiful chapter on this in his book, Freedom and Destiny, which is also very much about dealing with the paradoxes of living. And uh, the chapter is called The Significance of the Pause. And there's so much richness that can occur when one detaches oneself from compulsive, uh, routinized or regimented behaviors, whatever that is. And if one can disrupt that, even for a few moments, take a couple of full breaths 
and and just check in with what you're feeling, sensing, imaging. Um, I, I think that practice can be very helpful in starting on the road to uh, appreciating the the amazement of life, the awe of life. And, and it can bring people in touch with dimensions like the passing nature of time and life, which can be so uh, poignant as far as focusing ourselves on the preciousness of the moment, like right now, you know, if we really honed in on this, we're never going to have this moment again. So what, what does that bring when one tunes in to how all is passing? like that. Uh, it can tune us into the uh, capacity for wonder and surprise. You know, can you be open to something new, something fresh happening at, at any moment? Uh, especially, again, when you disrupt the mechanized way of living, something possible can happen. And you're even bringing that attitude to situations or people that you otherwise might have just chalked off as, oh, the same old thing's going to happen. So it can tune us in at that level, it can tune us into the, the vastness that we're a part of. And here's where we can get into more of a spiritual sensibility that people like Buber, Abraham Heschel talk about. Abraham Heschel talks about radical amazement. I love that. Paul Tillich. Yes. Um, you know, the faith to doubt, <laughs> uh, but th that ran, <clears throat> or the God beyond God, the radical openness to uh, participating in something great, much greater than oneself. So those are the f a few of the themes that it, <laughs> maybe I can just uh, convey that, that could be useful uh, to- Well, that- road. <laughs> Sorry, my earphone's cutting out a bit. Okay. Um, well, I think this is all very, very important work that you do. And I really yeah. appreciate you coming on and talking with me about it. And I hope to get it out to as many people as I can. Uh, we'll see how many that is. But um, I'll try myself to bring this this podcast out. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'm... Uh, uh, I'll be definitely looking out for any projects you're doing in the future as well. Uh, you seem to be, you seem to have a new exciting project every couple of years. So, well, trying trying to to live the the, the project life. <laughs> yes, it's part of that uh, life enhancing anxiety that I am blessed and cursed with. <laughs> but, Absolutely, uh, mainly blessed. Uh, but I, I really appreciated our time as well and, and your uh, openness to kind of, kind of venturing with me in, in this, uh, this dialogue. So thank you. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, we'll go ahead and hit the stop recording button here. <laughs>